You go on to verse uh, 35 where the Holy Spirit comes to Mary and tells her. The angel comes to Mary and tells her about the Holy Spirit too. It's very interesting. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. See, the angel came to Mary and Mary said, How can this be? Verse 34. I'm a virgin. How can a virgin have a baby? And he said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And power. Notice, Holy Spirit and power. Always it's like that. Jesus said that. When the Holy Spirit's come upon you, Acts 1 8, you shall receive power. Acts 10 38, God anointed the, Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. Holy Spirit and power go together. What is the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Power. That's what Jesus said. And here, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and power came upon her. And that is how Jesus came into her womb. And it's exactly the same. I remember when God met with me and baptized me in the Holy Spirit. This was the passage the Lord brought to my mind. That the Spirit of God has come upon you now, just like He came upon Mary to produce Jesus in her, to produce Jesus in your life. And that set a guideline for me throughout my life as to what the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming upon me was to produce Jesus in my life. And just like it took time for that body to grow inside Mary's womb, it will take time in my life for the character of Christ to become more and more manifest in me. I keep, uh, put that, keep that before you as a guideline. And then the Lord spoke to her through the angel, verse 37. Nothing will be impossible with God or no word that God speaks will be without power. That's a lovely promise. Nothing is impossible with God or another translation of it is no word that God speaks will be without power. If God has spoken a word, there is power in it. Let there be light. It's not just a word. Light comes. Let the earth come up out of the waters. The earth comes up. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Romans 6.14 It will happen. If you believe. No word from God is without power. If you take it as the word of God. If you think it is just Paul's idea or some preacher's idea. Then of course you will not have power. Because you don't believe it's the word of God. From the beginning of my Christian life. I have never doubted that this is God's word. I've never tried to analyze to find out whether this is God's word like a lot of people do and waste their life. I've believed it's God's word and gone to it and proved in all these years of my life that no word from God is without power. Now you be careful when you go analyzing scripture and you don't get any power. Take it as God's word and you will experience the power of God. Jesus never questioned the Old Testament. He was not bothered what all the critics and theologians said. He believed it and he experienced its power. Today, today the devil is leading so many people astray from that. That instead of believing it and experiencing power. They go around with all their cleverness. Trying to analyze and listen to what this person said and that person said. Reading this book and that book. And waste their life without the power of God. Which way do you want to live? You want to live doing all that? Or you want to believe it? Experience God's power? And live a useful life before you leave this earth? I would recommend that course of action to all of you. No word from God will be without power. And Mary submitted to that word and said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, verse 38, let it be done according to your word. I believe that's how we must submit. <clears throat> when God comes and says something to us, which we know will bring tremendous reproach upon us. I'm a great admirer of Mary, even though I'm not a Roman Catholic. Because I believe she was such a godly woman. <clears throat> God looked all over Palestine. <clears throat> To find one young woman, probably 18, 19 years old, who was really godly. And he found one. And God didn't make a mistake. She knew that the whole village will be spreading stories about her when she becomes pregnant without getting married. And she was willing to suffer that reproach to bring forth the body of Christ from her body. Now apply that to your life. 
You want to build the body of Christ in your village, but you want honor? Forget it. It'll never happen. If you're willing to suffer reproach, then it'll happen. A lot of people want to build the church and they want honor. And that's, I've seen people who try to do that. Nothing happens. They build a congregation, not the body of Christ. But if you want to build the body of Christ, it is always coupled with reproach, misunderstanding, wagging tongues, gossip. That's what Mary faced in Nazareth. But the result, well, it didn't make a difference to her. She brought forth the body of Christ. And so it is today. Those who serve the Lord, when they seek to bring forth the body of Christ in a locality, there'll be wagging tongues, gossiping, misunderstanding, criticism, jealousy, all types of things. Let it all be there. Ultimately, the body of Christ will come forth. It's always connected with reproach as we see right from the very first thing. Now, I want you to notice one other thing here. <clears throat> Do you know that Zacharias and Mary asked almost the same question? Zacharias asked the same angel, verse 18, how can this be? I'm an old man. My wife is advanced in years. Mary also asked the same question. How can this be? Why is it Zacharias was punished with being dumb and Mary was not punished when both of them responded initially in unbelief. Have you ever thought about that? There was a reason. Because two things. <clears throat> First of all, Zacharias had an example before him of an old man and an old woman who got a child, Abraham and Sarah. So there was no reason for his unbelief if he knew the scriptures. Mary did not have an example before her of any virgin in the history of the human race producing a child. So that's why she was not struck down. Secondly, <clears throat> Zacharias was an old man who had studied the scriptures from childhood. Mary was a young girl to whom more is given, more will be required. You know that if you are an older person, God expects much more from you than from some young girl. So, and if there's an example ahead of you and you have not followed it, you are more guilty than if another person does not have an example in front of them. That's why I say these people under the law, they didn't have an example. Today we have an example in Jesus. So there's some things we can learn from that. And we read further something about the way Jesus was born here. You know, there was no room in the inn. We know that story. And uh, he was born in a manger. Now, I believe that um, this is something that God permitted. He was born in a, verse 7, chapter 2 says, he was born in a cow shed in the little trough where the cows eat. You know, they had to come all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem to, because they had to register. That's because God allowed Caesar to pass an order like that, all for the sake of his son being born in Bethlehem. And so Joseph and Mary, otherwise Jesus would have been in Nazareth. The prophecy said he's to be born in Bethlehem. So God makes Caesar in Rome pass an order at the same time that all people must go for their census. Now, even in India, they take a census. But they never say, when you take your census, you must go your, to your hometown. To me, it's quite a silly rule. If you're just counting the people, why do they all have to go to their hometown? But anyway, that is God's sovereignty making sure that Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem and Jesus will be born there. And she did not deliver on the way. That could not happen because God's prophecy had to, the prophecy had to be fulfilled. But by the time they came to Bethlehem, there was no room there in the inn. And I believe God purposely delayed them so that by the time they came there, all the rooms in the hotel were booked. And I believe that Mary did not complain when she had these difficult circumstances in which to live. Do you ever complain when you have difficult circumstances in which you have to be? I mean, if you found that Mary was complaining and telling Joseph, I told you we should have started two days earlier here, you landed up here without any room for me to stay, no privacy and only this cow shed I have to give birth to. Can you imagine this murmuring, complaining attitude and the Son of God being born into that type of thing? That's why God doesn't, didn't choose any of the other women in Palestine. They were all the grumbling, complaining types. Why did he pick on Mary? Because he knew that she was a humble person who would be quite satisfied with whatever 
God provided for her. If it's a cow shed, it's a cow shed. And I don't believe she was complaining and blaming her husband for being late or not starting earlier. Because in God's sovereign purpose, do you think it would have been difficult for God to keep a room empty for them by the time they came to Bethlehem? Not at all. He who runs the universe could have easily kept a room for them in Bethlehem without any problem. He wanted his son to be born in a cow shed to show this world that all the things that the world considers great are rubbish and garbage in his eyes. I fear that the two extremes when it comes to Mary, the mother of Jesus, some who, some Christians who venerate her and worship her, which of course is wrong. Even the angels in heaven do not accept worship. They said, God alone is worthy of worship. Jesus said that, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And because some Christians have gone to that extreme, I feel some other Protestant Christians usually have gone to the other extreme of not respecting her at all or uh, seeking to learn anything from her. But she was certainly perhaps the most godly woman in the entire Bible. Because there must have been something in her that God saw to choose her to be the mother of Jesus. And she was probably a very young girl, 18, 19 years old. And um, God had watched her over a number of years and selected her. And um, any young girl, if you have a daughter or any young girl growing up, it's a good question to ask oneself. If, if you were living in Israel at that time, would God have chosen you to be the mother of Jesus? Through thousands of years, many Jewish women had a longing to be the mother of the Messiah. It was the greatest honor that anybody could have. Because they knew what the book of Genesis had said, that one day the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. They knew that the Messiah would come through a woman and so many women longed to be that mother. Why was it that God chose Mary? We don't know much about Mary. Mary is such a self-effacing person. It's always a mark of a godly man or woman that they don't seek any prominence. And you certainly see that in Mary's life. She doesn't seek any prominence at all. And I believe that's one reason why God chose her. In fact, when the angel comes to her in Luke chapter 1 and says in verse um, 29, um, 28, first of all, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. She's surprised. And uh, she's greatly troubled, it says, and wondered what type of salutation is this for some insignificant person like me. See, she had a low thoughts about herself. And uh, when the angel said, you know, you found favor with God and you're going to conceive, verse 31 of Luke chapter 1, and you're going to bear a son and his name will be Jesus. She didn't say, well, I sort of thought, you know, it'd be someone like me whom God would choose. <laughs> no. She said, how can it be? It can't be me. You know, I've discovered that that is one of the primary marks of one whom God chooses. They don't feel worthy at all. Any type of calling to serve him, to be an elder in a church, to preach for him. The mark of a man whom God has really chosen is that he doesn't feel equipped or fit or worthy at all. And that Many others may have felt very worthy, and that's why God rejected them. They were tested, and they failed. But here was one who recognized that she wasn't anybody. The Bible says, if anyone, Galatians chapter 6, if anyone thinks he's a somebody when he's a nobody, he's deceiving himself. Towards the end of Paul's life, he once said in, to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, I planted... Apollos water, but God gave the increase. 
What is the one who, the one who plants is nothing. And the one who waters is nothing. But God is everything who gives the increase. Paul had that attitude, not just when he began, but towards right till the end of his life. That's why God used him so much. And that's why God cannot use so many people. And you find that Mary was like that. I mean, right till the end. And even on the day of Pentecost, she was just no, not seeking any honor that I am the mother, you know, of Jesus, your Savior. No, no. She's just there along with the other. There were about 120 men, 20 men and women praying. And she was just lost in that crowd of one of the disciples. And you never hear of her again. Such a self-effacing woman. That's the type of person God chooses even today to serve him. Not one who is seeking to show off and show other people how much God has used them or how important they are. The other thing I want you to notice here is that the angel came to Mary. You know, she was going to receive... um, Jesus was going to come into her. And I find there's a lot of similarity here, something we can learn, because Christ has come into us also, in her physically, in us spiritually. And it's important for us to learn certain things here. You know, she, the Lord, uh, the angel came to her and said, You have found favor with God. Verse 30. I believe that that is something which every child of God needs to recognize. Have you heard God saying to you, if you have received Christ into your life, that you have found favor with God? That's very important to know that. You know, to know that before the worlds were created, God knew you by name. And chose you to be his just as much as God chose Mary way back in eternity to be the mother of Jesus. To me that's been a tremendous encouragement to know that God had chosen me before the worlds were created to be his, his child. In, in the midst of a world which is so insecure... That's the thing that gives us boldness and confidence to come before God. You are highly favored. You know, so many Christians live with a a, a low self-esteem. They feel they're so insignificant and so unimportant. And, And that's why they can't have faith and boldness when they come before God. God chose you. If you've surrendered your life to Christ, you may have given your life to Christ now. But God knew about that. The Bible says, way back in eternity. And he chose you to be his. You are highly favored. That's something which is very, very important. And when she heard this message, of course she couldn't understand how it could take place. And she said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And then Christ will be born. That's, that applies to us too. You know, for Christ, the life of Christ to come forth through us, it's as impossible. I wonder whether you realize this. It's as impossible for the life of Christ to come forth from us as it was for Mary to produce Jesus in her womb by her own, on her own. That we can understand is impossible. But sometimes we think with a little more effort and a little more grit and determination, we're going to produce the life of Jesus. No. We need to understand something right at the beginning of our Christian life. It is as impossible for me to bring forth the life of Christ in my nature as it was for Mary to have Jesus born in her womb. The Holy Spirit had to come upon her. And the Holy Spirit has to come and fill us. And that's what God has promised. And if I can open myself just like Mary, what did she do when she heard this message? That the Holy Spirit will come upon you. She said, okay, behold the bond slave of the Lord, verse 38, let it be done to me according to your word. And that's something we can learn. Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Fill me also with your Holy Spirit that Christ can come forth from me. 
And there's a lovely word here that the angel spoke to Mary in verse 37. Nothing will be impossible with God. There is nothing that is impossible. When we look at our own nature, and um, we can look, it can look as if it's impossible. That's exactly how Mary felt. How can I, a virgin, I'm not, I don't even know a man, how can I have a child? You say, impossible. And we can look at our own, you know, corrupt human nature and say, it's impossible for the life of Christ to come forth from us. And God's word is, nothing is impossible with God. And when Mary heard that, she said, that's fine. I accept it. That's what made the difference. And the Bible says that in verse 45, that because she believed, there would be a fulfillment of that word that God spoke to her. And I want to share something further here concerning Mary. You see, when she heard this, she didn't immediately go and talk about it. When God does something for us, and God's given us some honor... You see Mary's humility there in not boasting about it. And the angel had told her that her relative, Elizabeth, probably her cousin, had also conceived. She was an old lady, Elizabeth, and in her old age, she had conceived a child. And the angel said that to Mary to encourage her, to say, see what God's done for her, and God can do that for you. And what she did, there's something interesting here, that when she heard this message, it says here, she immediately got up, in verse 39, and went to fellowship with Elizabeth. She sought fellowship with someone who had experienced a miracle from God. When God wants to do something for us, you know, to produce the life of Jesus in us is a miracle. And if we seek for fellowship with people who say, oh, well, those things can never take place, we're not going to get faith. And there's something we see here that when Mary was going to experience this miracle in her life, she sought fellowship with someone else who had experienced a miracle. And that was Elizabeth. And that's something which is an encouragement to us to pursue as well in our life. Many Christians do not experience all that God has for them because they're seeking fellowship with the wrong people. They're seeking fellowship with people who say, oh, that can't happen to you. Nothing. God's promised you something, but it won't take place. uh, We live in a world which is surrounded. We're surrounded by people with unbelief. The world is full of these poisonous fumes of unbelief and we've got to escape that and seek for fellowship with people who believe that God can do a miracle. Nothing is impossible with God. So that's what we see here. And then further... The other thing I want to mention here is that when the angel said this, Mary was immediately aware of all the shame and ridicule and misunderstanding that would come upon her as a young girl when people discovered she was pregnant. Who in the world would believe if she told people that, well, the Holy Spirit came upon me, you know. It wasn't any man. Nobody would believe it. Nobody. Even Joseph found it difficult to believe till an angel spoke to him. And when Mary thought about all that, it must have flashed through her mind at that moment. So when she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word, she thought of these things and she was willing to accept it. She was willing to accept the misunderstanding from people who would not believe, who did not Know what the angel had spoken to her. And that's the type of thing that every true Christian faces as well. The experience of Mary is so similar, I find, to a person who receives Christ into his life. He faces the possibility of being misunderstood, ridiculed by those who don't believe that such a thing is possible. To become a child of God and to have Christ himself, the living, risen Christ living within us. And so Mary was willing to accept that ridicule. And later on we read how, you know, when the baby was born, as you know very well in Luke chapter 2, there was no room in the inn. And I can think I can see something, though it's not written there, of Mary's character. It's 
so awkward for a woman to deliver in a, without any privacy in a cattle shed. I wonder if in the history of the human race there was ever a woman who had to deliver in the midst of cows and donkeys. I mean, I've seen slums in India which are where the poorest of people live. And not even those poor women would deliver in the midst of a cattle shed. Why did Jesus choose that? Jesus came to save sinners. He came to save the lowest of the low people on earth. And in order to save them, he had to go underneath all of them. He came lower than every human being. And that's why when God planned the birth of Jesus from eternity. Remember, see you and I were born without our choice. But in the case of Jesus, he himself planned his birth on earth. And would it have been difficult for him to arrange for a room to be available in Bethlehem? (laughs) If he was planning it from all eternity... I mean, how long does it take to book a hotel room if you're traveling somewhere? (laughs) And if you've got all eternity for it. And imagine that God who could do that planned that every room should be booked. That there would be no room available. No relatives home available. The only place where his son would be born would be a cattle shed. That was planned. Because he came to save sinners. He came to save the lowest of the low. And that's why he had to be born there. And, of course, it it must have been so awkward for Mary. And I can imagine Mary, the, I mean, you women understand it better than we men, how difficult and awkward it would be to deliver with all the pain that you go through and no privacy, and the cows and donkeys, and all dirt, and everything around. And I don't believe Mary complained. I don't believe Mary started yelling at Joseph and say, why didn't we start a little earlier? I mean, <laughs> you had so many relatives in Bethlehem, you could have fixed up a room for me, or something like that. Can you, can you imagine Jesus being born into that type of atmosphere, of complaint, and things like that? I don't believe she had any complaint like that. And I believe that was one reason why God chose Mary. He found a young girl who would be willing to accept any limitations, any inconvenience, and submit to whatever. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. If that's what you permit, Lord. That was her attitude throughout her life. Not just when she said that to the angel. Lord, if you have arranged a cattle shed for me to deliver with no privacy, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Whatever you say, I'll accept it. This is the mark of a godly woman. It's not preaching and prophesying and doing miracles. It's the willing acceptance of whatever God sends into our life without complaining. The Bible says, do all things without murmuring and complaining. Because we believe that God is in control. There must have been some faith in Mary to believe. Surely, God in heaven must have planned this birth long and long ago. She must have had nine months to think about that. This is not a sudden decision of God. God has planned all this. And I'm sure she, he has planned some place. She never knew it would be a cattle ship. But she knew that God had planned something and when it happened to be a cattle shed, all that meditation that she had about God's plan encouraged her to believe, this is God's plan. It's not the ideal circumstance for me, but this is God's plan. Blessed is the man and woman who can look at their circumstances and look at the surroundings that God has provided for them and say, Lord, if this is your plan for me, I'm not going to compare myself with anybody else. This is what you have planned for me, and I accept it. That's the type of person God's looking for even today. There were certain qualities there in Mary. 
which God chose, which made God choose her. And notice also, you know, later on when Jesus left his home at the age of 30, the first incident that we see in his ministry was in the marriage of Cana, where you find Mary, the mother of Jesus again, coming to him and saying, they have no wine. John's Gospel, chapter 2 and verse 3. And his reply is, what have I to do with you, woman? See, that gives the lie to all the people who say, if you want to get Jesus to do something for you, ask Mary to tell her, tell him. <laughs> well, she told him and he said, what have I got to do with you? Remember that. You don't have to go to Mary. You can go to Jesus directly. So here she goes to Mary, um, Jesus and says, you know, all those 30 years, it must have been such a shock to her to hear those words. Because the Bible says that for 30 years, he submitted to her at home. But now he was baptized. He was moving out into his ministry as a son of God. And he needed this mother of his to recognize that this was a new relationship coming up now. Woman. He doesn't even say mother. Woman. Lest anybody think that she's the mother of God. No, she isn't. Woman, what have I to do with you? John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 4. My time has not yet come. All these 30 years I listened to you because that was my father's will to be an example to others who are at home. But now I come into another phase of my ministry. And you've got to recognize the old relationship is gone. Gone permanently. And the wonderful thing about Mary was she was not offended. It's beautiful to see that. To accept that. Okay? If this is how it has to be from now on, I accept it. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be as you have done. At another time, we read that Jesus was in the midst of a crowd preaching. And somebody came. You read that in... Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, towards the end of that chapter. Some folks came up to Jesus and said, Your mother's outside. You know, the mother of the great preacher. There, the mother of the great miracle worker is there. She's waiting to meet you. And Jesus says loudly, Who is my mother? These who hear the word of God and do it. He makes that break with her so clear to everybody. And she's not offended. She remains the same humble woman she was when the angel met her throughout her life. As I study the life of Mary, I don't have time to go into all the details. It's this humility that stands out so strikingly. Never getting offended. Not complaining. Accepting whatever, whether it's a cow shed or whether being called a woman or being cut off when Jesus went into his ministry. Her attitude was always, behold the handmaid of the Lord. I'm not surprised that God chose such a woman to be the mother of Jesus. And remember this. She didn't have many things we have. She didn't have a Bible at home like we have. She didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within like we have. And yet, she could rise to such heights. That shows us what Tremendous heights we can come to if we accept the same humble position before God and God's Spirit fills us. Christ can come forth from our life. The day of Pentecost, we read in Acts chapter 2 that she was just one among the crowd. She was probably around 53 or something around that time. And young Peter, 33-year-old young man, was the leader of the apostles. And nowhere... Do you find her trying to take some prominence as the mother of Jesus? And there's a tremendous example there in Mary for every young sister and older sister. One whom God can use mightily because God gives his grace even today to the humble. 